Welcome to Context Free. It's been a while. Last time I showed off my WebGPU WASM runtime. And while I have continued to work on that, I got myself distracted freshly again on programming language development. And here's an example of the kind of thing that I can parse in my reboot of my language design. I use equals for all definitions, not assignment. I'm trying to decide between curly braces and B end for my blocks. Don't have much in the way of semicolons. Colon gives you types. And again, equal sign gives you definitions. I expect to have parentheses for calling or just spaced out arguments as well. And my keyword for defining an upcoming function is for, because really I think for loops always sort of wanted to be function callbacks anyway. Yeah, there's details to sweep under the rug. We'll get to it someday. Anyway, so here's a sample kind of program. And there's a lot more I could get into, but we'll skip it for now. And my current incarnation, I'm writing in Rust, where I'm mostly just going to be cargo building and then running it separately so I can see the time of just the execution itself. I've also been using a little bit to shrink down the executable size because I want to imagine how small it can actually get, despite Rust static linking. Link time optimization is slow, so I mostly don't run that. So here in my main program, I run through a number of steps. I set up some resources first so I can try to reuse things. While I haven't measured my number of allocations, I'm trying to keep my number of allocations to a minimum, as well as my overall memory usage. And I'm also trying to use dense arrays rather than a lot of individual objects in memory. We'll get to that. I'm also using string interning, such that all my actual string references are just 32-bit numbers. And I'm using lasso for interning, which is a third-party library. I'm not quite sure exactly how I want to do this, but it worked for my imagination at the moment. Anyway, I lex my input source file into an array of tokens, then parse it into a parse tree, normalize that into more of an abstract syntax tree, and then I pretend to be running, because I have this imagination that I'm going to go through an iterative process of running for things like type inference. But for now, mostly I just have variable resolution inside of there. And I dump the tree at various points to see what it looks like. Anyway, the lexer goes through the source code and pulls out tokens or lexemes, such as IDs, operators, and so on. And I have an enum to define what kind of things those can be. And my imagination is that I reuse a single lexer object across multiple files and then reuse these buffers instead of having to keep allocating and deallocating things. That's the imagination, even though I'm only doing one file at the moment. Anyway, I have a really simple system here that doesn't do a lot. As you can see, this is like most of the code. And anything that's chunked together they don't have special handling of just becomes identifiers at the moment. I'll probably have to refine that some in the future. And then I take a list of tokens and I turn them into a tree such as this parse tree here. So we can see comments, space, and everything else shows up in the parse tree. Every single piece of text that appears comes in here. And when I print these trees out, I use the interner to map my 32-bit uh, interned numbers back to the strings again. And I use 32-bit numbers throughout because I can't convince myself that 16-bit numbers are big enough, and I don't want to ever have 64-bit numbers because that's twice the RAM usage. I don't use pointers anywhere pretty much in any of this. It's all indices into arrays. And I've purposely chosen 32-bit indices. So we can see here how this text gets turned into this tree with special node types. But the parser really is rather simple also. It's just recursive descent. I have some clever things around some of my weird elements. And I do still need to parse strings better. I can't really use this meaningfully right now. Uh, so I have to break apart the components and deal with things like escape sequences and so on. But we'll ignore that for the moment. To see what our trees look like, I have a node. And then I have something smaller than a node that I'm calling a nod, because I'm too lazy to figure it out. The parse tree is made up only of nods, which is primarily going to be branches, things with kids, and leaves, which contain tokens. The rest of these things aren't really ever going to show up in a parse tree, but I haven't made a separate type between the parse tree and the abstract syntax normalized tree. They're just the same thing for me. And I haven't even used things like this in the future, but I'm imagining, again, if I'm iteratively evaluating the tree in order to work things out, I'll probably have values appearing in the tree along the way as well, you know, inline to compile time evaluated things. So a parse tree just has nods, and a full tree has nodes, where in addition to the nod, it also has a spot for keeping track of the inferred type, 
which might include things like, you know, unions of literals like we have in TypeScript. I'm strongly considering that kind of thing, but work out it later. I don't really have a representation for types yet. And I have some kind of source index where these are just, you know, new typed things that are just integers to index, but with a little bit of type safety around them. So this is eight bytes and each nod is up to 12 bytes, which means as a whole, it's 12 bytes in size, which is four bytes for the branch kind and eight bytes to give the range of children. I am using these sort of unique identifiers. We'll get to them later. I'll probably actually coalesce them into one type at some point in the future here. Anyway, a norm to tree looks like this, which is easier to read and leaves out a lot of details that we don't need from the parse tree. It also normalizes how things look. Every definition is a def with an ID, the static type, and a value. I probably also will need other kinds of metadata on here as well. But I sort of want to think of these, even though this is a dense tree of 20 byte node sizes, where I push on the children before I push on the parents so they can reference them. I sort of like to imagine that they're sort of implicitly structs inside of here. So if you ever find a deaf node, it's got three children of particular types. And I might put in some like abstract traits around here to make it so that I can interact with this tree as if they were structs. But again, we have a def here, which was inside of our other def, and then we have a call. So we see here this def message of type text explicitly given, value high. Again, I need to parse strings better. Then I have a call to print twice with a message. And so my imagination is that every definition, again, has the ID type value even if there was none given, in which case I just have an empty node in the tree. Down here for print twice, I've defined print twice with no explicit type given, though it would be inferred for the function that it is. And then the value is a function which has input parameters and output parameters, which is just the type of null, which probably could be a good default. Sort of using that as the void slash unit type and no explicit name on that return value. So we see how this becomes a consistent sort of structures inside this nested dense tree. Again, our trees are just vectors slash slices of nodes. And I have an abstraction for the nodes versus nodes here. So I can use either one in some cases. But to see the difference between our parse tree and our normalized tree, we can see all the stuff that got cut out here and some things that got introduced to make sure that I have this regular structure inside the norm tree. The norm process, receives the parse tree, which is just nods, and a place to stick the result. It's gonna reuse the same buffer over and over again throughout. Again, I'm not trying to reallocate a bunch of memory. I just have a few dense arrays that get reused as the processing goes on. So I trim out the junk from the tree, and then I go through and normalize the definitions into the form we just saw previously. Where that normalized definitions is a little bit messy, and the trimming is relatively small. That's all it does right now. That's the whole code. And then I take that norm tree and I put it through the run process, which has a lot more things to work with for keeping track of, say, variables for resolution, where I have order independent top levels, and then I have a stack for processing as I go in looking through all the child elements. And I've made the stack resolution of variables just a single vector that I can push and pop from rather than trying to make a hash table of it, for example, because I figure if there's only a few variables defined inside any local scope, then the effort to create a hash table and feed it just to use it a couple times and then clean it out is gonna be very inefficient. So I figure just linear scan through hopefully few local variables at any given scope level should get the job done. But the top level, I imagine a whole bunch of possible definitions, very large modules. So I might as well have a hash table there for each module. And then what I do right now for the quote unquote run process is I convert plain token IDs into the more unique IDs with numbers on them. And I put all the top level definitions in the module. And then I go and resolve the references to the definitions. And for kicks, I also print out a little bit of debug information along the way. Beyond that, again, I'm printing out these trees as I go and I'm keeping these trees in Git so I can see when they change. That's all I have for quote unquote unit tests so far, just these gold tests of what I expect the tree to look like. Anyways, after I do the quote unquote run, I end up getting unique IDs on things and certain levels of resolution. So for example, I've defined main that before was just an intern key into my, you know, interner. 
Now I know it has a particular ID. So I'll probably call this like UID in the future. And I think I'll combine the ID defs and ID refs because you know it's a def because it's inside of a def. I don't really need a different node type for it, I don't think. Anyway, this message that's inside of my main function is different from the message that's a parameter inside of my print twice function. So it has a different number on the back. And I'm able to resolve print twice back up here to the module top level scope. And I'm able to resolve this message inside of here to the local message or the same down here. And working out the resolution is actually pretty straightforward because anytime I see a new definition I can push, anytime I leave a scope I can pop, where anything that's inside of a params block, I don't pop it because it should be able to be useful inside of the local scope as well. That's the entire rule set for resolving across the stack. And you notice here, I wasn't actually resolving my built-in types and functions yet because I'm not parsing this yet. Uh, and I haven't really worked across multiple modules yet, but I'd like to. And I'm, and I'm imagining possibly using nims star suffix to indicate which things are exported from a module. Still thinking about it, but that's what my current bias is toward. And so I'm imagining parsing and combining this into this resolution here will be the next thing. So instead of still saying id text or id null, it'll actually resolve out to whatever I got from my core definitions. So let's go ahead and run this, see what it does. And it doesn't build quite that fast. It was already built. But what it did do is write those trees out and dump out my defs and relatively quickly. Again, I don't know for sure how many allocations it's making, but I try to think of how to keep it small. I found some things for measuring allocations in Rust, but they seem to require like nightly Rust or something. I didn't dig into it yet. But a quick look for what these definitions mean. I'm using zero as sort of like a null space. So the first real definition is at one. And we see that definition one is at index 30 inside of our tree array. Definition two is at index five inside of the tree array, where I'm pointing at the index in the array that represents the tree where the definition is located. So if anybody says, ah, I'm going to use message at two, then I go to index two in my definitions array, which then jumps over to index five, which I don't have indicated here, in my tree array, which is going to be, in this case, this node. So it's like two levels of indirection. But any one of these things is a 32-bit number, and all of these are dense arrays, so hopefully going to be very cache friendly. Anyway, that's all I got for now. Maybe for fun we should change something here just to prove that it does something. Let's switch this to buy and run it again. Let's see what changed inside of our files now. If we bring up the git diff, of the quote unquote run tree, we see that the high has changed to buy. Anyway, maybe in the future, maybe I'll work a little bit more on this, then get back to my talk of web GPU wasm runtime. I don't know, we'll see how it goes. This is just my hobby stuff. I hope to make some progress on them though. If you like the video, be sure to subscribe. Bye y'all.